Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Nintech. Thank you for being here today. Uh, for those of you that are here uh, in person, uh, uh, thank you for braving the weather and, uh, and coming in for this presentation. My name is Jose Rivera. I'm the executive director for the New York Metro Parks and Transportation Council. It's a mouthful, so we call ourselves Nintech. Uh, those of you online, uh, welcome to uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, great to have you uh, participating. Uh, for those of you that are attending this uh, the brown bag for the first time, uh, the brown bags are intended to be part of the Intex uh, regional trend series, uh, where um, we we try to provide uh, the public with a, a front row seat uh, to hear more about current trends and developments that are shaping the future of transportation, uh, not just in this region, but uh, in, in other parts of the country or, or the world. Uh, autonomous vehicles and, and connected vehicles, uh, they're moving closer to becoming a, a mainstream reality uh, with self-driving cars being tested across the country and, and in New York State. Uh, the future of transportation is taking shape and, and we want to be able to, um, to look at that uh, further. So today we have a special guest um, from the Contra, Consta Transportation Authority in California, CCTA, uh, Randy Iwasaki, uh, who will share his experiences running the nation's largest secure testing facility for autonomous vehicles, GoMentum Station. Previously, Randy uh, served as the director of the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. Um, spent 26 years in Caltrans in, uh, with Caltrans uh, in various engineering and management positions. Um, Randy
the um, uh, as the um, as the uh, director of the Contra Council Transportation Authority um, has a uh, lot to share with us today. Uh, so, um, without further ado, we'd we'll like to introduce Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. If I start sweating, it's because of the humidity. I can really feel it. I know you can't, but uh, I can feel it right when I got into the subway. It was unbelievable. I'm not sure how you, you can stand all that, but in San Francisco, you don't get a lot of that. It's very dry heat. So I'm just putting a plug if you want to move out to California. You have a lot of, a lot of good jobs. Not a lot of affordable housing. So I've got 30 minutes. I'm going to go through this very quickly. We're a, we're a sales tax authority. We're also the congestion management agency, so we measure congestion in Contra Costa County at about 140 different locations, and we produce a congestion management plan that is then is given to the NPO that helps define what the congestion rate is in, in the Bay Area. It's very confusing sometimes in California because we have so, so many different agencies. So you have the federal government, the state government, the counties. You also have the council of government, the NPOs. We're a sales tax authority, so we fit kind of right underneath the NPOs in the Bay Area. So that's kind of where we sit. If people ask all the time, where are you from? Where, where's Contra Costa? It's right next to Oakland. It's along in state 80, in state 680, it's in the Bay Area. We have about 1.1 million people in our county. We'd be the 43rd largest state of the union, just head of Rhode Island in 99 New Hampshire. These are some of the things we do. You probably do some of the things too as an NPO. We fund bicycle, pedestrian, walkways, pathways. We have a, a bus pass program for underprivileged youth. That is, they, it's along Interstate 80, the cities along our, our Interstate 80 is there. If the kids get a free lunch, they get a bus pass. We fund that. We want them to get to school to educate and get a nice job. In the future, we fund BART, or subway systems capital improvement, and we also fund transit operations, bus operations. Our existing sales tax measure is a half percent for 25 years. Started in 2009 and 2034 generates about almost two, $2.3 billion over the 25 years. The recession kind of knocked it down a bit. So a multi-pronged approach to redefine mobility or try to figure out ways of dealing with congestion and cost of cost accounting. We're not going to be widening, widening freeways. We just finished with a, a $1.3 billion investment extending BART from Pittsburgh out to, Ant out to Antioch. That's about 10 miles. That was a half a billion. And another $800 million worth on the state highway system. In Contra Costa County, I, we have a staff of 20. And we're highly rated on Wall Street. We're double A plus, double A plus. In fact, we're going to go off another bond sale, so maybe I'll be back in the near future. We're going to do $200 million of fixed rate note deal and for $100 million, another $100 million for a floating rate note because the tax laws have changed and we have a synthetic derivative or a swap that protects against um, fluctuations in interest rates. We have 20 employees. No spiking. We're limited by 1% on our admin costs, and we're very transparent. So we've won the uh, government, excellence in government financing reporting for the last six years. So we're platinum rated on our, on our audits. So we had a long, we have City 1 0, City 2 0, City 3 0, and now our, our version is City 5 0. But the, the idea here is Eric Garcetti is the mayor of a small city in Southern California, Los Angeles. And he came with this idea of City 3.0. What he's trying to do is have connectivity within that city so that he can leverage technology to reduce the cost of services that he provides to citizens. And so he always asks you, who's the largest taxi cab company in the world today? Uber. Uh, Uber doesn't own any taxi cabs. Largest seller music? iTunes? Uh, no, no record stores. So our idea was you place a, a subscription-based transportation system within that connectivity, whether it's a mobility on demand, or it's, it's your CAV, your connected autonomous vehicles, or a subscription-based low-speed shuttle to provide personal last mile connectivity. We went to City 5.0 and kind of one up Mayor Garcetti City 3.0. And the joke is that I love Hawaii 5.0 and it sounds really cool, right, City 5.0. But actually, 5G technology is coming our way. So how, in our business, do we leverage that technology to provide services so that it, it reduces the cost of those services? Because I've never heard any transportation official 
in my 35 years to say we have too much money. And so what we're trying to do is use better data to make better decisions on existing dollars and then leverage those as far as we can. We need better information. We think that city 5.0 concept is going to work in the future. We're on the right smart mobility, but I think overall our, our infrastructure is going to get smarter in the future because we have better access to better technology. So in the midst of a mobility revolution and why the autonomous vehicle technology, and you can read it as well as I can, but the cars refuse to crash, your system is going to get more efficient because crashes cost a lot of your congestion in, in New York State. In California, about half the congestion is not recurrent, and the majority of that is accidents, some of it's weather, but the majority is accidents. You're going to get you're more efficiency, air quality, we're bullish on the electric motor, we're actually going out with an RFP to study how do we put an electric vehicle charging system, a grid in, in Contra Costa County, it could be a model for the future. And lastly, this technology is the only technology on the planet today that I've seen that can help us get to the underserved community. I'm getting older, I can't walk as far or as fast, but I still want mobility. Or the disabled, or if you don't own a car, then how do you get to and from the destination? We think this technology is, is a great opportunity. So you know this as well as I do, but 94% of the causes of accidents are caused by human error. Yet the Department of Motor Vehicles issued you a driver's license saying that the software is good. That's by 95%, 94%. So that's the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration numbers. And when I worked for Caltrans in 2005, 2006, about 42,000, I remember the numbers very well, 42,000 people were killed in the United States. The numbers started going down in the recession and went down even further. Now it's going up. It's going in the wrong direction. And we need to do something about that. And I mentioned the accessibility issue. It's very important. You can actually, there was a study done, if you have access to mobility, you're whatever, however many times more apt to break through that poverty line than if you don't have good or access to good transportation. So we think planning is going to change the way we plan the future. And that's just our thesis. It may not be yours. But what we've done is we build our a comprehensive countywide transportation plan. We do it on a five-year cycle, four to five years. And every year, our planning director says, says his benchmark is I've done five of these now. And I'm saying this is done right. Your countywide transportation plan, your long-range plan, generates a capital improvement program. So if you're working on the wrong projects because you won't need them in the future, you're probably doing your taxpayers here a disservice. And so in the middle of this presentation, for this market, so we've gone out and we've changed the way we approach the public. Normally what you do is you have an open house somewhere, let's say you have an open house in here, people, because it's, it's accessible. And you have 20 people over here that are your consultants, and you have 20 people over here, generally they're not happy with you. So you don't really get a good kind of feedback on what, you, what, the, what the public wants. And so this cycle, we decided to change the way we approach the public, and we got out using technology. So I don't use Facebook, but I hired a, a young lady. She's our deputy director. Or she's our director for social affairs. She understands Facebook, Instagram, all these different things, tools that the younger people actually use, which I don't, but they do. And then what we did is we inverted the telephone town hall. So the technology used is I'm running for governor. Here's my message. This is a message approved by Randy Ibasaki. That's what I want to do. So it goes out to a million people, two million people, depending on what you're running for. What we did is we robocalled 15,000 people in our county. We broke them up into four subregions that say east, west, north, and south. We went out and we robocalled and sent flyers to 15,000 people in each of the four subregions based on the voting, based on voters. And we probably got uh, a large number of people online, and we'd screen the call. So you have screeners over here, and you get somebody asking using foul language. We wouldn't answer those questions. But you get somebody talking about, well, why is my bus service cut from location A to location B? Okay, so we'd answer that question. And then they would say, you know, we really need to spend more money on transit, or we need to spend more money on potholes. And so all these things, when you add them all up, when we update our countywide transportation plan, we got more comments this cycle than the previous 25 years combined. So the first thing that people hate, they don't like potholes. Can't you do something about the Scotch Garden potholes? The second thing they don't like is those Scotch Garden red lights. Now that's my language, not their language. 
but they don't like them at midnight when you're the only person coming to the intersection. Why are you picking on me? And that's not true. That's just the way the signals are sent. Third, they want a better bar. But fourth, they want a first and last stop solution. I would take transit and suburban applications. I just can't get there. Or by the time I get to the subway stop, there's no parking, so I have to drive anyway. So that's when we decided to come up with, that's how we got information together to come up with the first and last stop solution. I'll talk a little bit about that. So we are changing the way we do our demand uh, forecast modeling. And I, was, I, was, I gave a number on a PRV event about a different highway capacity number. And a young man in the front row stood up and said, you just said a number that's different than the highway capacity manual. So I said, by the year 2050, I think the highway capacity of a lane would be around 3,000 vehicles per lane per hour by the year 2050. And he was arguing, and I said, well, I'll make it that right now. That 3,000 is going to be closer than 2,000 because of the, the space on vehicles and technology. But good news, don't be around 2050 to pay if I'm wrong. <laughs> but traffic demand modeling, and we're also modeling greenhouse gas reduction. So if you think about your plans, they did, the National League of Cities did a study, this is a few years ago, and they looked at the 18 or the 68 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. One metropolitan area from each 50 states plus 18 more. And those plans, three of 3% of the plans had the Uber and Lyft impacts identified in them, maybe not solved. We kind of identified Uber and Lyft as an issue for a long range plan, 3%. And then 6% consider the impacts of autonomous and connected vehicles. And so I think that now we're starting to see more and more long range plans taking that into account. But I think this is a, an issue that you may or may not be doing yourself a favor because you're going to be working on projects that you may not need in the future. And I think we need to work together to figure out what are those projects that we need to work on in the future. So climate change, by the year 2040, in California and Contra Costa County, we need a 58% zero emission fleet turnover. By the year 2040, plus about a 15% reduction in BMP per capita, and we'll glide in by 2050 that 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. So now we're going out with an RFP to figure out, okay, how do we support that infrastructure? How do we support the infrastructure that's needed to support those, those zero emission vehicles? And this is just a couple slides on we don't need to widen the road, but this is, I don't know the answer to this. I will tell you what we're doing in Costa Costa County. We're probably not going to widen the state 680. We're probably not going to widen the state 80. And we're not going to widen the state Route 4 again, more than likely. Do you need the inside lanes? Let's say there are 212, so you can get through the gates and then leave the outside lane for trucks and buses at 12 feet. Maybe. I mean, we're trying to put buses on shoulders in Costa Costa County, and the California High Patrol doesn't want us to do that. Um, so they, they haven't allowed Caltrans to do that in San Diego when I was in the director's office. We got uh, an agreement with CSP. It worked marvelously in San Diego County on Interstate 805. And the pilot ended, so now we've got to go through the process again to do another pilot to test whether or not it's going to work. But what would it cost to add another 12 foot lane on Interstate 805 in San Diego, I 5 in, in California? This is just part time solely this. It's a part time transit way the way we have to. Call it. That's what we have to call it in California. And then complete streets. We're really loving this whole notion of complete streets. So we take, we call it a road guide, we take four lane arterials when you live in a neighborhood and you have a transit center at the end, why do you need four lanes? So we're taking two lanes and we're making it more walkable and bikeable to incentivize your ability to walk to that transit stop or walk to that, that subway stop or let your bicycle can be safer. The highest increased percentage bikes in the fatality is pedestrians. So we have to do more to protect the pedestrians and the bicyclists if we want them to do that. And in California, we want you to ride a bicycle, even though percentage-wise, that's, that's going to be an issue. So we have momentum space, and it's, it's about 5,000 acres. It's a military base, a naval base. It's stored weapons in World War II. It's about the size of San Francisco. And we have a license to test on a little under half of that, about 2,100 acres. It's kind of an aerial view on the lower right-hand corner. And Shannon used to work for Honda. This is where Honda kind of ran in circuits, so when their, their cameras could see the red, yellow, and the green lights. So it, it, when, it, when the light turns red, the car stopped. When the light was green, the car went through the intersection. They ran cars in a circuit, back and forth, back and forth. You can repeat these tests over and over and over and over again, and you don't disrupt anybody. In fact, here, if you're testing and your car happens to hit something, you don't have to report it. 
tested even after it's from the beginning. They, they, they're, they talk, they're, they're onto their, their Honda platform. They started on the active platform, now they're on Honda. And the same, you'll hear this, is they, they, it's like a beanie on top, the LiDAR spins, and then they got all the sensors on the bars. And the other day, Honda brought out their, their third generation vehicle, and there's nothing on it. And Paul Cummings, who's the chief tester, was saying, those guys still have a beanie on their car or whatever. So it's pretty funny. He was talking about the advancements of what Honda has done. And Toyota Research is working on their artificial intelligence. So our SAB project, we got the first piece of legislation in California to exempt ourselves from the brake pedal, steering wheel, and the operator. Because California state law was passed to say you need an operator, you need a brake pedal, and you need a steering wheel. So when we brought this shared autonomous vehicle, for the first one into, the, into North America a few years ago, I asked Francois Ligier, can you put a steering wheel in this vehicle so I can, we can actually kind of hear the state law? And his response was, and they're, they're manufactured in France, and I can't do a French accent, I apologize, but why would I put a steering wheel in a car that drives itself? I said, so the answer is no, he said, absolutely. I said, okay, so we had to get a piece of legislation exempting us from those three things. We secured a private sector funder of the leasing these vehicles, so it's really a private-public partnership. We, we had to obtain permission from the city. We got a waiver from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration because you have to import these one at a time. So every time you import this vehicle for testing purposes, you have to go through NHTSA, you have to get a waiver. The vehicle weighs too much. That's not a golf cart. If it falls under the 3,000 or about 35 miles an hour or less, production rate, you know, rate of 2,500 units, so that's over two years, but it weighs 6,000 pounds, not 3,000. And we got the first license from the California DMV for driving these vehicles on public streets, so that's what we're testing now. We have to go through the California Public Utilities Commission because in this case, it's a private-public partnership. So we, our third vehicle, we have access to four, the second generation now is down in the city of Dublin. And so that is being administered by our transit agency, so they don't have to go through the jitney service law of the California Public Utilities Commission. And these are our partners. First transit, if you contract out your transit service, they're going to bid, bid on the drivers and, and equipment. Bay Area Quality Management District is trying to clean the air, so they give us a million dollars. And AMG is our strategic consultant, BART, they, they're worried about parking. Parking is going to be affected, so if you're, if you're planning on building a multi-story, 528 $38 million parking structure, make it between the floors higher than this so you can actually put a fault ceiling and you're going to repurpose that parking structure as an office space or another, another type of facility. We're getting proclamations from our city saying we're open for business, we're willing to allow you to test our city. And I think that, that's very valuable for us. These are our challenges. So sentiment, people just, they don't trust the vehicle that drives itself. They want somebody there to take over. Well, the elevator was very much the same many, many years ago. You had an elevator operator. I actually was at, in New York, I was at that uh, Times Square in the hotel I was in. There was no elevator operator. I was really frustrated by how the op elevators were. It takes 10 minutes to get an elevator going up. But you get the point. So we're trying to, Triple H trying to get the word out to say this is the results of our testing and this is the reasons why you don't need to be afraid. You're going to find as you go down this path that there's going to be laws that you're going to have to overcome. You're going to have to pass a law to overcome another law. That's just going to happen. But in the future, let's work together to make sure that the laws aren't conflicting so we don't have to pass those that piece of legislation because they're getting embroiled in other pieces of legislation. And I don't know how it works in Europe and in California. They may hold your piece of legislation hostage for something else. So you've got to worry about that. It's, it's, it's makes your hair gray. And CCT, this is our challenge. And I think the last one is for us is one of the most. I'm an engineer. We have manuals. You want to build a bridge? Go to manual. You want to build a highway? Go to manual. Stopping site distance, all this stuff's new to There's no manual for this technology. You're making this stuff up as you go. It's kind of fun, but you're at risk. And generally, if you work in the public sector, you're not compensated to take risk. And so you have to really like it, and, and, and we really like it. But the team knows that at the end of the day, I'm the one that's expendable. How do you provide personal security if there's no driver? So if somebody's punching somebody else, what's going to happen? And then cybersecurity is a big issue. It's not here. So these are some of the impacted industries where all that that was going to get impacted. 
park, I talked about park food fast food. You may not want to stop in the future at hotels. You may just, car may just drive on. And you're going to sleep. You're going to get up in the morning and do your thing, and you're going to get to your location. I haven't quite figured out how to charge the vehicles if you're using electric powered vehicles, but maybe it's an inductive charging system along the way. Well, let me go back here real quick. So we have a air train that goes from, it's a BART facility, but it goes from the Coliseum stop to the Oakland Airport. And it, it costs, I can't remember what it costs, but hundreds of millions of dollars. The ridership is down because Uber and Lyft is cheaper. So this is where I think the long range planning, this model I take a look at that. That's transit. Path forward, so we can come out and talk to you about what we see. And Try to give you our side of the story. You can say Randy's not correct or whatever. That's fine. But we, we come out and we tell you that's our agreement with USDOT that we would do that. But we're planning the process. We're, we're changing the way we plan the future. And you might want to take a look at your plan. We engage where we can. Flexibility in the regulatory environment, if at all possible. We want to leverage your technology that you can find. Consistency and striking and signing. I'm a, I walk around New York City and I, I see different areas have different types of signs. So those could confuse the vehicles as they move forward. So if you have a vertical red light and yellow signal system versus horizontal, those all have to be factored in. And then if you have different laws in different cities or states, you're going to have to geofence around that and the software is going to have to change. And so that's just an issue. And we try to collaborate and partner when we can. So that's my 30 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Randy, that was very educational in 30 minutes. That's uh, very impressive. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll start taking questions, uh, starting with those that are here first. Uh, I think the gentleman in the back. Uh, okay. Thank you. I see some huge problems with it some of what you presented. I'll give you a good example. If you go to 23rd Street and 5th Avenue here in New York City, you'll find that 23rd Street has been narrowed because of the expanded sidewalks. You have a bicycle lane. You have a bus-only lane. And you only have two lanes for vehicles. Um, two or three cars get to move ahead, and then they're at a red light because they can't move. Now, uh, with this plan that you're doing, uh, Mayor de Blasio, when he first got into office, said that he wants to ban automobiles in New York City. And is this part of that whole idea of his? No. No, absolutely not. The, um, I disagree. Oh, okay. <laughs> When you're talking about these autonomous vehicles, it seems from listening to you, you're talking about autonomous vehicles for private use and not, say, like shuffling people from A to B and for multiple people to use, or am I not hearing that properly? So this vehicle here, C6 is 106 more, I apologize maybe for not going into more detail on this. So this is the first and last mile solution is our shared autonomous vehicle. So it's up on the right-hand corner. So C6 is stand six more, and Best Mile is a, a partner that deserves this is what these things are wandering aimlessly around your city. And, and these are really good for suburban applications. They're not going to work in your urbanized areas. And so we're trying to figure out how to deal with first and last mile solution in urbanized applications. And this vehicle is one of those potential solutions, and we're testing that now on public streets. And we're not trying to take the place of buses. We're trying to feed those buses. Because a lot of times people complain that, hey, why are those buses empty off peak? And sometimes during peak hours, and if you ask people, they say, we can't get there. We would like to take the bus. We just can't get there because it's too far away. There's no parking. Or it's just I can't walk that far. And so we're trying to take, take that. We also have a good project. It's called, it's with uh, Caltrans. UC Berkeley and Tri Delta Transit or transit provider. We're also trying to protect the connection between modes. And so BART is a little bit late. The bus takes off because it's trying to keep a schedule and it's gone. Now you gotta wait another ten minutes or whatever the headway is. And so we're trying to use technology to protect that connection. 
but we're trying to use this as a first and last mile solution to that problem that we have with suburban applications. So we are trying to take cars away. So the idea is then software platform that's going to be overlaid within the software computers on this and computers on this vehicle on these vehicles. It'll help you figure out what route to go after it learns the routes or what's most efficient based on who's calling it. So it has a come get me component and drop me off at point B. We're also trying to roll out our mobility as a service on MOS or in the United States it's called MOD, mobility on demand. So we want to roll out hundred electric vehicles in the southern part of Contra Costa County. And it really kind of boils down to you have an app that has all your data. And so I want to go from point A to point B. What are my options? I want to do it for as cheaply as possible. I want to do it as green as possible. And then you get the various options of which your other modes may be an option, may be able to help that. So we're trying to roll that out in southern part of Costa Costa County. So this application currently, and this may resonate maybe a little bit better. So we have a 600 acre business park in San Ramon. You've got BART in Dublin, that's our subway, and BART at uh, Walnut Creek. That's about 12 miles. So in order to build a BART extension down Interstate 680, the eight force commute in the Bay Area, is $8 billion. We're trying to pass another half cent sales tax, now not 25 years, but potentially for 30 years. That only generates around $3 billion. So if you don't do anything over the next 30 years, just collect those dollars, you're $3 billion, but it's going to cost you current dollars about $8 billion to extend BART. So in the meantime, the owner of the business park paid for express bus service in the morning and the evening to drop BART riders that work in the business park, and they circulate throughout the business park, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. Likewise, from Walnut Creek BART Station, clockwise, counterclockwise. And then they're done for, for the morning peak. In the evening, in the evening they go opposite. So then, but in the meantime, all these people that live around this business park, they can't get a ride because they can't park in Bishop Branch. So those buses dead head back. Now imagine if those buses had 40 or 50 people. Per bus, that's 40 or 50 less single occupant vehicles running throughout San Ramon. And that's 40 or 50 less parking spaces taken. So now there may not be a need for that additional Dublin park parking. And that's about 38 million for 520 spaces. So that's kind of, kind of the concept. Hi, I heard you talking about recharging infrastructure and technology, and I thought that when Governor Schwarzenegger was going to get done some lead work in terms of doing set aside and maybe some infrastructure for recharging, is that incorrect or not, or are you dovetailing on that? We have not found that fund. Okay. No, we, we're just more excited to work for him, but we, I haven't seen that EV. So CARB might have some money, California Air Resources Board. We, we, we think that the Bay Area Air Quality Management District may have some money. We got a grant to do our RFP from the California Department of Energy, and we're looking at if we can access any of the Volkswagen settlement money. Okay. Oh, um, just to follow up to that, you talked about induction technology. Maybe you could expand about, uh, on that a little bit for the audience, maybe? So one of the partners that we have at, at Gomentum Station, we just signed in, and there's a press release on it. On it. It's a company called Elix. But the idea is here. So when you plan the future, if you're going to use today's technology, you're going to have type 2 chargers or superchargers in strategic locations. But in the future, if you have inductive charging, then that infrastructure may or may not be needed. And so we wanted a combination of today's infrastructure at strategic locations. And then how do you pay for that? What's the business model? And then what is the future technology? For? So there's a company called Elix, and they use magnets. And, and they, they generate power depending on the size of this box. And they want to partner on this project because this, these things need to be charged. And so how do you charge electric buses at night if they're all depleted? And so someone's going to have to do something in order to charge those vehicles. So we have a pilot project in Walnut Creek where we bought four electric trolleys, 29 footers. They're first OEM based electronic or electric buses, trolleys in the United States, and they're inductively charged. So the system is built in, and we use a company called Wave. Uh, based on Salt Lake City, and it looks like the top of a 55-gallon uh, can buried in the ground, and you can see the PG&E, that's our, that's our electric provider over here. 
that vehicle makes its rounds, it comes back to the site, it lowers itself to that passenger off and it dwells there for 10 minutes, and it goes back around again. And it does that until it gets about 50% depleted, and it goes back into the barn and they fully charge it. And that's the process we've gotten in, but they bought another four, so I think there's eight. So we're really going toward Governor Schwarzenegger's 50% reduction goal, or 80% reduction goal by 2050. I was hoping you might be able to uh, confirm the story. I read that the first ticket given to an AV was given in San Francisco. A uh, police officer gave uh, the vehicle a ticket because it got too close to a pedestrian. Uh, if that's true, um, it brings up the question of who would be responsible if an AV broke the law. Would it be like in New York where uh, the vehicle owner would get the uh, ticket if they go through a red light camera or a speed camera? And are those considerations that you're thinking about? Yeah, I can't. I can't confirm that so there, there was a ticket. I probably would have heard it, but I, I have not heard that, so I can't confirm that. And the vehicles are designed not to make those mistakes. That's why they're they're very they're very cautious vehicles. If you've ever ridden a level four vehicle that drives itself and it's based on precision mapping, it's a real really boring ride. The vehicle will if there's a pedestrian that walks in front of it, it'll stop. And, and it will give you enough path. It, it, it's a very abrupt stop currently on, on that vehicle there. I mean, all the media was, I, I told somebody to walk in front of the vehicle to prove that it would stop. And so one of the team walked in front of it, it stopped immediately, and everybody was in this plastered against the front end of that vehicle. And so they're trying to teach you to stop more like a human. So I don't know how to, I, I don't know if they have a flaw in the software that they make a mistake, how that's going to work. But they could issue a, and a lot of these I think are going to be a shared kind of a vehicle. And the ownership piece is what we're trying to figure out because we have a private public partnership out in San Ramon, but we also, the third vehicle went to Dublin and it's being administered by a transit agency. So that's a private or public private partnership. So who should own, maintain, and operate these vehicles? That's a question. That's what we're trying to figure out. But I guess the further you're, your question, because I don't know the answer, who's going to get the first ticket and all that, and if it doesn't follow. But our problem is, as transportation officials, we don't know where these near misses are occurring between pedestrians and bicycles, but these vehicles will, because they have sensors all over the around. So imagine a day when you're getting data to make better analytics on where you should prioritize your investigation on how to make that intersection safer. Right now, what you do is you measure fatalities and injuries, but you don't see the close misses. And so these vehicles will store that information. That's some information that we want to get out of that vehicle. Skidding, where you have problems with friction, so the, the, the analog brake goes off in location one. My car comes, same thing. I skid, analog brake system goes off in position number one. It goes in, and they say, hey, we better go out there rather than have 14 people injured or whatever the number is, and then scratch the surface to restore friction and then do some kind of overlay or something like that. Hi, I'm just wondering with respect to your travel demand model and how you incorporated the autonomous vehicles, did you develop a new volume delay function or just assume a certain increase in capacity? Or how did you go about that? If you, if, I'm not planning on civil engineer, but my my team has hired TJKM, and they just released a paper. And so, if you give me your car, you will. I didn't. I don't understand what they said in the paper, but you. Uh, <laughs> they have a lot of the technical kind of situation, but they validated it's going to be more. It's going to be somewhere between three thousand and thirty-three hundred. Uh, we're going to have to pass a little bit to the online questions, basically. Uh, Steve Gale has a question. He says, I'm interested in your thoughts or whatever long range still makes sense at the time uh, when mobility is evolving quickly. How do we select the most strategic investment when we are entirely uncertain about 10, 20 years or so? Or should we have, say, a long range planning? So I, I think that the best way to 
answer that question is that's the reason why we're trying to plan the future. We're, we're going to make mistakes, but I'll use parking as an example. If you're going to build a parking structure based on what you see today, and it, generally parking structures are the most valuable pieces of land that, that are on the planet. They're right around transit, facilities, and those kinds of things. If you're going to do that, based on what you know today, you may want to think about making it, as I say, repurposable so you can do something else with that building. If, if we have a Uber lift problem in, in urbanized areas, the built infrastructure is very difficult to modify. And so when you get dropped off by Uber or Lyft, at least in Washington, D.C., you know, there's, you take half the capacity. So if you have four lanes, two lanes in each direction, and that Uber vehicle or Lyft vehicle is stationed out there waiting for four people to pile in, you're going to miss that light that you worry about because you can only get excuse me, two cars through that light, and everybody knows it. So somehow, these these technologies that we see in the future, we're going to have to get creative on making sure that when we make those modifications to the built infrastructure, that we make them with an eye toward the future, than rather than an eye than your experience from the past. That, that, that's the way I answer that question. Thank you. Um, regarding widespread implementation of the technology, um, and whether that's good movement or people movement, uh, what are some of the major barriers that are facing um, implementation regarding uh, whether it's policy barriers or sort of on a social level, um, behavioral acceptance, or some other areas that are some of the major key barriers for implementation? So, I think the number one is, is ne it's never been done before, and so it's a transformational issue, and so there's got to be a lot of testing, a lot of proof that the technology actually works. There are laws on the books. If you go to NHTSA's regulations, they, I think they say driver, I can't know the numbers, but more than once, and they say you know, steering wheel a lot of times and taking over operations, and they're written based on trying to make the existing technology safer. That's, okay. that's great, because that's what NHTSA is supposed to do. They're supposed to make sure that the vehicles adhere to the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. But when you have these odd technologies that don't fit into that, then how do you deal with that? And then how do you get the people comfortable enough to say, okay, we're going to start with a driver to take take over. So on, on commercial vehicles, on trucks, the law says you're going to have, you can drive it in AV mode, autonomous vehicle mode, but you have to have your hands over the steering wheel to take over just in case. How long do you think you can drive holding your hands over a steering wheel? Like this, without resting them on the steering wheel. That's not, that's not hard. You get carpal tunnel or something, something will go wrong with your shoulders after a while. And so I think the biggest barrier is, is, is new technology and, and people aren't comfortable with it. But the automobile manufacturers, Silicon Valley folks, they're all working together to try to deliver this technology for a number of reasons. But from a transportation perspective, we try to be as simple as possible. The vehicles will refuse to crash. They're not drinking. They're not tired. They understand the rules of the road. Striking plans, I see, in fact, my, I shouldn't say this. I won't say it. I was going to tell some, somebody crosses a double yellow and they think that's okay. And I'm like, hey, that, you just did an illegal move. Well, no, that's legal. No, it's not. So we have these, these it's complex, and these vehicles will, will solve that, some of that problem. They don't get tired. But it's really customer acceptance, consumer acceptance is, is difficult because it's new. I think some of the regulatory environment is needs to be modified a bit. And then you have to go through your state legislature to get your laws. And that wasn't easy for us to, to get it all the way through to get the government to sign our, our Assembly Bill 1592 because it's new and you're taking risk. So uh, something we have in this region that you probably don't have is winter weather. Um, yeah. Has there been any testing of AVs in those conditions? Yeah, so we, we try to sign agreements with the state of Minnesota. So Minnesota just rolled out the, this easy mouse shuttle, and they're, they're doing winter testing. And they're doing high wind testing in Finland. So, so you know, we're, we don't get – the beauty of Walnut Creek, it, it never it freezes every now and again. It, 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 it's never snowed since I've been there. And so we can't test snow and ice, so the, the – the joke is, we'll go to Michigan. It snowed 10 months out of the year there. If they're on, they're, they have a test bed as well. Thank you. I see um, an engineering question and a human nature question. Okay. Engineering question is, this works at a certain scale. 
And when you scale it up, you, you're in unknown territory, so to speak. So either computer modeling or what, but still unpredictable. Then you have urban situations. Now, if you're in New York for a little while, I would suggest you just walk around Midtown and see how humans react in terms of not obeying the street lights, bicycles going all different ways. What do you have when you have a certain amount of autonomous vehicles in the same environment as non-autonomous vehicles? So you're going to have a competition. And if you ever watch taxi cab drivers on Fifth Avenue, trying to get a fare, go across three lanes of moving traffic, you know. So how do you how do you uh, deal with that? I mean, it's you know, it might work in, in, in the suburbs, but in, in an environment like New York City, that's a problem. You're absolutely correct. So I, I did spend some time in New York City. I got here on Saturday evening, went to dinner with a friend of mine, and the next day I, I walked to 34th Street. And I, New York is random. The crossing, the, the people will cross anywhere, anytime. And you have people like, I thought the guy was trying to commit suicide by bar or whatever they call it. He just walked right out and stopped himself and walked right across the street and cars are just zooming by. I mean, how do you, how do you model that unpredictability? If you've been to Shanghai, it's worse. Vietnam is worse. They, they cross anywhere and there's no rules and their cars are going like really fast and they'll stand in the middle of the road. Those autonomous vehicles, they'll stop. They'll see it and they'll, they'll see it as a fixed object. So you have to model that. We're, we're really a suburban application. And so we're testing suburban applications in the, in the really urbanized areas. The, the technology may be freight. It may be delivery at night. It could be other things. But I, don't, I, I agree with you. It's, it's very complex. And the modeling is very going to be very difficult. The AI, their artificial intelligence has to be tuned for that randomness. And then how do you stop like a human where you, you see it and those kinds of things? These vehicles will not, uh, they haven't struck anything, I, I think, that they, they didn't want to, or weren't trying to strike. They're, 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 uh, it's very, 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 the sensors are very good. They go way out in a long way. Hi. By the way, crossing a double yellow is permissible if you're pulling into a driveway. You're absolutely right. So I'm talking about passing. Um, but what will pay for a scaled-up version of all this, higher taxes? I mean, funding for this has to be incredibly high. And who's going to pay for it? I mean, we're already paying high taxes in, uh, in this region. So the – and I, I heard a guy speak the other day, and yeah, Tony Ziba. I don't know if he's a futurist. And the idea, so Lyft is testing out at, out at the station. The reason why, they want to take the driver out of the equation. So the most expensive part of Lyft is the driver. So you start getting down to, let's just use, the, let's use 20 cents a mile. The question is, will you own a car at 20 cents a mile, or will you just pay somebody if they give you door-to-door -door service? So you, most people that own a car don't do the, the numbers per mile based on the depreciation, the maintenance, the insurance, all those factors. So I guess, well, I can't say. Does anybody here know what their vehicle costs per mile that they own today? So if you can get it down to 20 cents a mile, say 10 cents a mile, you start running those factors, you're probably not going to own a vehicle. And it's, it, it, people that come to New York City or San Francisco, but they ne don't necessarily have to own a car, because they have access to other modes of transportation. So this is all part and parcel to that overall equation. And you're right, it may not work in urbanized, heavily urbanized New York, but it will work potentially in health issue out of suburban applications. Now we're trying to figure out what we do in rural applications. So you know, as a follow-up, um, let's say you need to go to Costco or Home Depot or something like that, you need to bring home a sheet of plywood. Um, I don't see how this autonomous vehicle is going to be able to help. I mean, so, there are you know, logistical uh, questions that, you know, just can't be answered with these vehicles. Well, I, I got to answer that really quickly. So they take the autonomous vehicle out to Home Depot, you rent the, the pickup that says it's 1850 a, a day or whatever, and you bring your car It's costing me more money. No, it's not because you factor in your, the ownership of your car. 
that's a flat cost. Do you have any other questions? Uh, just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, it's from Gail. This is Skip the Saskai. Sorry. Uh, what goals were set to determine what would be considered a successful when uh, a success when a final stage is over? And if you consider it successful, what is next? So we're gonna run it to you. She's talking about is she talking about her shared autonomous vehicle pilot project? I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, so we're on a two year testing period. We have to we tested at Momentum Station so all the sensors actually did what they said they were going to do. That was really important for us. Then we moved it to a parking lot that was not inhabited or not being used, a very large parking lot, and we tested it there, and then we got our license to roll it out on public streets. So the idea is can it circulate around that 600-acre business park, picking up people and dropping them off? Because the idea now is they're, they're randomly dropped off in the 600-acre business park by the express bus service, but in the future, we want to drop them off at their intermodal centers. And then we want to pick up the passengers that these vehicles go into the suburban neighborhoods and pick up people that actually want to go to the BART station, whether it's Dublin or Walnut Creek, and then, when they, and then vice versa. If they can do that, that will mean that is a, a successful pilot, and then he'll buy 20 of these vehicles or the technology, maybe not this technology, but, but a first and last model of a shared autonomous vehicle, that's the goal. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, so, and this is a little bit piggybacking on that question, um, but as you're moving from the pilot programs to more long-term relationships, um, how are you thinking about procurement? And I know that that's sort of the back end, like, less sexy part of this, but that's one of the big hurdles that I see um, trying to make sure that the public sector procurement um, processes are working to both pay the private sector operators or combine payment with um, individuals and private, and private sector or the public. Or It just seems like that is a huge issue that is going to be a big hurdle to overcome. Right, so, so we, when we procured these vehicles, we, we didn't go through an RFP. We just went out and we went to Europe and they had a city mobile project in Europe I came a few years ago and one of the challenges was how to solve the first and last mile problem. And so we called a university professor in Rome and he said the most advanced technology three years ago was this technology. So we flew to France and cut a deal for four. We tried to get the exclusive agreement for these vehicles in the United States and of course we couldn't get that deal. And so we got two delivered to us and then one more just the other day and we have access to one more. So we didn't go through the, the whole RFP on that. We just used private sector money for the first two and we procured that. It was about a half a million for two, for two years. On the, if it ever goes out in the Bishop Branch application, the private sector will buy 20, whatever the technology is. But when you get to the, the other one in Dublin, that's overseen by the transit authority, they're going to have to do a competitive procurement based on the technology. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do you write an RFP with enough flexibility to make sure that you get the latest technology, not old technology? And that's really hard. No matter what you buy technology-wise, it takes six months to get the procurement out. It takes three months to deal with all the protests. It takes another couple of months to modify. And then when you finally award, let's say a year later, you're on technology two, not one. And you just, you're saying, I want to buy one. So that's an area in, when you try to innovate, Sometimes the procurement rules really don't help you, but I mean they're there for a purpose, and we try to adhere to that every time we go out to procurement. But in this case, we just went out and got the latest. It saved a lot of time. I have a follow-up question, Randy. Sure. Uh, so, given all the um, um, all the controls, uh, given the need to deploy deploy these vehicles in a highly controlled environment. How do you see the initial deployment of uh, autonomous vehicles? Initially, you know, how do you how do you see how do you see it? Uh, I mean, we know that we know that we're not going to see them initially in a, in a very highly congested uh, urban environment. So, how do you see the initial deployment of these vehicles? I, I think the technology will be deployed commercially. I, I think in the, the trucking industry, I think you'll see trucks put that technology on to make them overcome drowsiness and things like that. I see that, and then I also see this low-speed application. But this is a little more difficult because 
whenever you work in an urbanized application, you have a CF variables that may or may be, you, I mean, you can model all you want, but you're going to have a gazillion options, and you may not model one option that happens where a dog and a cat and a shadow and a balloon or whatever in the same place and confuses the vehicle. Those, all those things have to be addressed. But when you're on a freeway delivering bright white of beer in Colorado, cruise country, you know, you get the AV mode, that, that technology may expand the, drive, the driving time of a commercial vehicle, the truck driver. So, one or two additional questions? Um, I want to know if you have any insights about pricing, like uh, if in the future will the public uh, or government put some regulation on the pricing of the SAV? Because as you mentioned, uh, uh, it, won't, it might feed the public transit if it can stop the uh, one mile uh, one, one and like for those people living far away from bus station, it can help, the AV can help them get to the bus station, but like, if the price is too high, like it's well beyond uh, the cost of the trans public transit, like they might not really use AV. And if it's way too low, like people can just only use AV and not use public transit, like how can you balance that problem? Thank you. The, the cost of the technologies that are, that are used, both hardware and software, to make, make these vehicles smarter and they can see further and those kinds of things, they're getting uh, smaller and faster. And, and less, less expensive. So the price of the technologies coming down as the testing evolves is still very so you're not going to spend seventy thousand dollars on your vehicle to add on to make it driverless. That's just not going to happen. More than likely it's not going to happen. But as the testing occurs, these vehicles are already getting it's, these vehicles now are best gen one, gen two is smarter and it's less expensive. And so all the components that go on into your vehicle to make them <laughs> driverless or self driving. Those technologies are getting cheaper, less expensive, faster, and smaller. That's important. And I use this analogy. Many years ago, US DOT had a, had a national automated highway system program that Caltrans, when I was there, participated in with, with Carnegie Mellon, UC Berkeley, uh, General Motors was the car company. And in 90, 1997, it, it culminated with a hands off, wheel, feet off health demonstration on I 15. And we used to laugh because the trunks were full of computers and fans because if the computers got hot, they would shut down. And the fans would keep the trunk closed, but were just full of PCAT. I mean, this thing had just a shock load of computers because they were very large. Today, the technology the, of the sensors, they're embedded in your, in your bumpers. They're little buttons. Those things you laugh at at the size and the clunkiness of them. Today, they're all just very, very small. And the car manufacturers are getting smarter and faster and better at trying to implement these kinds of technologies. So adaptive cruise control, lane keeping technology, level two, two things, those are becoming commonplace on your vehicles. So I think it's a transition as this testing occurs. And that was in 1997. I still remember that. But I'm getting old and I'm going to retire pretty soon, so you're going to have to remember those kinds of things in the future. <laughs> I guess that may be the last question. So in our own very, very preliminary timeline of how this might begin to affect demand, transportation demand, through the middle of the next decade, from what we've seen in the literature and the media, it's going to take that long for EVs, say level four and above, to become fully legal. Is that a reasonable forecast? The middle of, of this century? No, decade. Next decade. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For the, for the AVs to become fully legal. Yeah, I, I, I think within the next 10 years. I think that the progress of, you know, we got a license. So if I had asked you that a year ago, you just said, no way, Randy, you're not going to get a license. There's no way. But well, we got a license. So it's not, and it wasn't easy. We have to, you have to develop a testing plan, 138 different tests that you're going to, we have to make that up. We have to develop all these, how you respond, like this vehicle is electric, so where can you touch it, where can't you? How do you tow it? All these tests have to be developed and given to the DMV to read and then figure out, okay, maybe they're right. You have to get approval from your, your city police department, the police chief. That says, yeah, I, I understand, and my team is ready in case something happens. The thing we're worried about is how these vehicles react after they're hit and their computers are jarred, because a lot of times, Honda will complain that, or other partners out in the test bed, that the test bed is too rough. The, the, the railroad tracks are too rough. Well, there's rough roads out in the, in the built infrastructure in your cities and the counties. So pro probably within the next 10 years, I think. 
Joe will be here, so don't <laughs> call me up. <laughs> All right, well, this is a, a great presentation, Randy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and both to you online and those of you here, uh, again, thank you for, for coming in.